Well, I'm glad to be back with you this morning. Uh, I uh, missed y'all while I was over at our Southwood campus for a few weeks. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Brian. Uh, in the intervening time from when I was gone to now, I'm guessing that most of you uh, either started school or your kids started school, and I hope it was a good start to the, the school year. Uh, my guess is, if you're like us, you, had, you have some grand ambitions for this year, right? Regardless of how last year ended, you started this year saying, this is going to be the year that we get all the priorities in order all of the kids will be at school 10 minutes early every day, right? I'm going to get them there. And so you start well. This is the year, college students, you say, this is the year that I am going to get that 4.0, right? And, and by December, you say, okay, maybe a 3.5. By May, maybe a 2.7 is fine, right? Whatever it is. Parents, you say, yeah, 10 minutes early by by. December, you're going, you know, uh, if, if they get there by third period, it's probably okay, right? <laughs> by the end of the year, you're like, if they get there three, four days a week, that's probably enough schooling for them, right? <laughs> Over the course of the year, your, your focus and your energy tends to drift. I saw a little while ago a, a picture that showed the difference between the lunch we make on the first day of school versus the lunch they take on the last day of school. I thought you might enjoy this. So first day of school on the left, there's a, there's a banana that says, I love you, right? Little sandwich wraps individually wrapped up, individually stri sliced strawberries. On the right, it's like whatever you can find, right? Bag of Cheetos and a bag of fruit snacks. You start with good intentions, but your, your, your focus fades over time. Why does that happen? Right, I thought about that this week. Why does it happen? Why is uh, September parent so much different from May parent? Right, the reason is because over the course of the year, a couple things happen to us, right? First of all, we just get tired. We have to get up and do the same things every day, day in and day out for months on end. We get tired, the kids get tired, their resistance increases, our care factor decreases. But we also get distracted, right? There are things that can distract us, other things going on in our families, other activities, other challenges in our lives, right? All of them might be important things, but what happens is we start with the best of intentions and then we kind of drift. We forget the intentions we had or the vision we had at the beginning of the year. I share that because I think the same thing that can happen to parents over the course of the school year can happen to us as Christians over the course of our lives. If you think back to those times when you first trusted Jesus, or at least those times in your life where you began to really uh, believe and absorb the reality of the gospel for the first time, where you said, I want to live my life for Jesus, you think back to those times, you said, I want to know the word of God. And so you might have spent hours reading the scripture so you can know it. You might have spent hours in prayer. You were focused on sharing the gospel. Well, what happens over time? Well, our, our, our vision tends to fade. Why? Because we get tired and we get distracted. The same thing that can happen to us as individuals can also happen to a church. All of us have probably visited churches at some point in our lives where you walked in and you thought, man, 50 or 60 years ago, this place started with a dream, with a vision, right? They said, we want to reach our community for Jesus. We want to be a people who worship Jesus, who know him deeply, who tell people in our community and in our world about Jesus. And maybe 50 or 60 years ago, that's where they were. But you walk in today and it's a club of people who might or might not like each other anymore who gather together and sing some songs and hear a message, but they have no focus. And they're declining. Every Christian and every church faces that danger. I think that's why throughout the course of the New Testament, Paul often refers to the Christian life in terms of a race, right? I'm not a long distance runner. Two or three miles at a stretch is my maximum, and that's pushing it, right? Some of you I know, you're longer distance runners, 
right? And you know that you can hit that point halfway through, three quarters through, where you are tired, you are thirsty, you are hungry. Anything sounds better than continuing that race, right? So you can fade over the course of that race, right? So throughout the New Testament, Paul writes these passages that read like this one in Philippians chapter three. He says, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. He says, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In other words, he says, if we compare the Christian life to a race, Paul says, I want to be found at the end of that race running as fast as I can. I may be tired. I may have been tempted by distraction, by unbelief, by doubt, by fear, whatever it is. He says, I want to run across the finish line with the same level of energy and focus with which I started it, right? Easy to start a race, a lot harder to finish the race. And so I share that this morning because as Grace Bible Church, we're a collection of people who are running this race. We're running it together and we face the danger, like every church, we face the danger of losing sight on those things that matter most, right? There are, there are things that matter most to us as a church that are the same kinds of things that really ought to matter most, I think, to every church. Right? Because when Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave his people a commission, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. In order to do that, we need to know what he taught. We need to know who he is. We need to learn how to worship him. So then we go out into the world. And as Dusty said it earlier, we help people find and follow Jesus. That's our task. That's our mission. But in order to do that well, we have to keep running with focus. So what I want to do this morning is we start a new semester. Before we start a new sermon series next week, I want to refresh for us those values that are most significant to us as a church. And the way that I want to do it this morning is really by means of looking at the name of our church. We are Grace Bible Church. So we're going to look at each one of those three words, Grace, Bible, and Church, and talk about how that informs our focus, how that informs what we do. How are the things that we value reflected in the name of our church? This is also the Creekside campus of Grace Bible Church. So I am going to talk a little bit about what that means and how we contribute to the broader vision of Grace Bible Church. But let's look for just a few minutes at the things that we value. All right, first of all, there's this. We value the gospel of grace. Very first word in our name is grace. We are Grace Bible Church. Now, it may be you've been here for 20 years. You may be, this is your first time in the room. Wherever you are, let me just reiterate what the word grace means because it's central to who we are. Okay, the word grace basically means a free gift. When we talk about the grace of God, what we're saying is this. God has given us things for free that we don't deserve, right? He's given us things for free that we have not earned. Most importantly, what he's given us for free is, is the eternal life through Jesus, all right, so when we talk about the grace of God, when we say the grace of God is central to what we do, what we say is that at the center of everything we preach, at the center of every event we put on, at the center of every program we run, is the reality that we believe that all of us have sinned against God, and so what we deserve is separation from Him, right? The scripture talks about death as not only a physical thing, but a spiritual thing. We all are destined for death, both physically and spiritually, separated from God forever. So what we deserve is that, that separation from God. But God, in his grace, he gave us eternal life because he sent his only son, Jesus, who died in our place. He died to forgive us of our sin, our, our disobedience against God. And then he rose again. And when he rose again, that constitutes a promise that Jesus claims victory over death, over sin, over Satan, and he can offer eternal life to everybody who believes. So when we say we're Grace Bible Church, really from the very founding of our church, way back in 1965, 54 years ago, that was at the center of who we are. To say we're gonna be a church that proclaims the gospel of Jesus. So you will hear it in every sermon that I preach. There will be a moment in every sermon that I preach where I will reiterate the grace of God. It's in my notes every single week. And you may get to a point where you go, yeah, I know it. I've heard this a thousand times. And next week I'll say it the thousand and first time. 
because it's of first importance. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says this, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Paul says these are the things that are of first importance, right? So we could have the coolest kids' ministries, and honestly, I think we do. I see all of you guys in here with the the new teal shirts, and I love it. I think we have the greatest kids' ministries maybe in the state, but if it's not centered in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then it's for naught. Several years ago, I was about to get on to an airplane, and I was thinking about uh, this issue of first importance, because as we were about to get onto the plane, they came out into the terminal, and they made an announcement. They said, there's a delay. Your flight is delayed, because there's a warning light, I guess, on the dash of the airplane. I don't know how all that works on airplanes, but there's some kind of warning light, and they're not putting you on the plane until they figure out what's wrong with the engine, right? And so people began to grumble a little bit because they were going to get to their destination late, right? And I, that was my immediate reaction too. Man, I'm going to be late. But then I paused and I thought, no, wait a second. I would rather get there late than not at all, right? If there's a warning light on the engine, let's go ahead and fix that before you strap us all in and fly us wherever we're going. Why? Because what's of first importance? Well, it's not getting there at 2.30 or whatever. What's of first importance is getting us there safely, right? So when you get on a plane, the pilot has really one thing that he needs to focus on, and that is keeping the plane in the air until it's supposed to come down on the runway. You don't want your pilot thinking about peripheral things, right? Nobody wants the pilot to come back and say, would you like another bag of peanuts? Why? Because you're going to go, isn't there something more important you should be focused on right now than talking to me? Nobody wants to hear as the plane is headed into the ocean. Is the temperature comfortable back there, right? Anybody need a refill of Diet Coke? Because what's of first importance? You'll even figure out what's of first importance if there's turbulence or there's a problem in the air, right? Because even the flight attendants will say, sit down, buckle in, don't get up. All of a sudden, what's of first importance comes to the center. What Paul says is this, nothing is of first importance apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? We are Grace Bible Church because that's at the center of everything that we do. So sometimes when people say, why don't we engage more in political issues or social issues or this, this issue or that, why don't you talk about those things more? It's not because those things are of zero importance. They matter. But they only matter to the degree to which they flow out of what we understand about Jesus and about God and who he is, right? So at the center, we say first and foremost, we wanna know God, we wanna know and study and sing about what Jesus did and what we sang about earlier, that Jesus died and rose again. That's of first importance. That's why we do events like we mentioned earlier, the big give, right? We love giving furniture to international students to get them set up here in town, but we do it really primarily because we're saying this, this is a, this is a gift of grace. This is an act of grace. We are giving to you for free what we have. And here's why we do it because God has given to us for free something so much greater and eternal than furniture. And we want you to know him. It's why we give so much of our budget at this church to overseas missions because we want to be a part of spreading the message of Jesus Christ to every tribe, tongue, people, and nation on the planet. So that's of first importance. Because of it's, it's of first importance, let me also say this. Uh, if you're in the room this morning and you don't know that you know Jesus, the message for you this morning is simply this, that Jesus died for your sin. Right, you and I, we've all disobeyed against God in some way or other. We earned the penalty of death, but Jesus, God's only son, he took it on our behalf and then he rose again. And all who trust in Jesus will have eternal life, will one day get to spend forever with God and with his son, Jesus Christ. If you don't yet believe that, if you don't know that you have eternal life, you're welcome to come talk with me or anybody else in this room who's wearing a name tag or somebody that you know that brought you here. Because our prayer is that you would leave knowing and believing what is of first 
importance. We value the gospel of grace. Secondly, we value the word of God. We are Grace Bible Church. We are a Bible church. It's right there in our name, right? So we preach from the Bible. Uh, Starting next week, we're going to start a new series. It's called Kingdom of Priests, but essentially we're going to preach from Exodus through Deuteronomy. Right, And some people might go, why are you preaching from a section of Scripture that always puts me to sleep, right? Leviticus is where year-long Bible reading plans go to die. I know that. I know how many times uh, people start it and they get to Leviticus and they get about three or four chapters in and they go, I can't do it anymore. I'll read the Bible in 2020. Why are we doing it? Because we believe that all of the Word of God is given by God for our growth for us to understand who he is. And in fact, there are deep and rich truths about God that apply to our lives today, even in the book of, yes, Leviticus. Because God's word has power because it came from God. One of my favorite passages in the scripture about the word of God comes from Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah says this, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, And do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So will my word by which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. All right, so a couple days ago, we pulled up into our driveway and my wife, Shannon, she said, the lawn has that uh, August look to it. It's half green and half brown. And I said, yeah, it's because it hadn't been raining a whole lot and it's like 127 degrees outside. So what do I do? I just, I'm gonna keep it on life support until it rains again, right? Because it needs the rain to grow. Without any rain, without any water, it'll die, right? And that's what, that's what Isaiah says about the word of God. It is as critical and as powerful as water to the crops. Without it, it will die, right? And so he says the, the rain comes and it waters the earth and the crops grow and it bears fruit. And that's what the word of God does in our lives. Paul would say this in 2 Timothy a different way. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work, right? This is why we preach from the scripture. This is why most of our sermon series are rooted in the word of God. All of them are rooted in the word of God. This is why most of them we say we're going to go through a book of the Bible or some books of the Bible. This is why our Bible studies, we say we're going we're gonna to learn together how to study and apply the scripture, right? Sometimes people have asked me, but aren't you just filling us with knowledge, right? Aren't you just filling our brains with information, right? Isn't that counterintuitive? Isn't that contrary to application, right? In other words, you're just filling us with knowledge, but shouldn't we go out and apply it? And here's, here's what I say to that. No, when Bible study is done correctly, it's never meant just to end up here. It always makes its way into our hearts, right? What we know about God changes what we think and believe, and then that changes what we do, right? I need to understand who God is and what he's done in order to reflect him as he wants me to reflect him. We have a daughter who is about to begin uh, driving in a couple of weeks. She's going to get her driver's permit where she can drive with us in the car, right? So we're going to talk about prayer here at the end in a few minutes. You guys... Pray for us. But here's the thing. I promise you, the first day she gets her permit, I'm not going to put her behind that wheel and say, okay, let's drive to Dallas. No, there's going to be some instruction, right? There's going to be some information. So we're going to sit there and I'm going to show her, here's how you switch from park into reverse into drive and make sure you do the right thing at the right time. Right, here's where the mirrors are and they need to be adjusted. Here's your speedometer. Here's your gas gauge. We're going to go through some information. Why is that? Because what she's about to do, the application she's about to undertake is a matter of life or death, right? Specifically, my life or death. And so she needs to have some stuff locked in up here first. I'm not just filling her mind because I just want to bore her with information. It's because what she's about to do is affected by what she knows. Some of you in here are doctors. I've never been to medical school. I'm just going to take a guess that the very first day of med school, they don't walk you into a room and say, hey, here's a scalpel. Take out that guy's kidney. Right? 
They give you some books, you study, you learn things like where the kidneys are, right? I wanna make sure I've got a doctor that doesn't just kinda generally know the region of my body to start cutting. He needs to know, right? But we don't complain, we don't go, why are you making them learn so much stuff? No, this is a matter of life or death, right? And we believe that spiritual life, the spirit matters every bit as much as the body. And it's not that you need to know everything about God or about the gospel before you can go out into the world and proclaim it or reflect him. No, you you absolutely don't. But there are some things about God that are critical to understand and they're written in his word and it's a lifelong process just as a good doctor or a good driver will continue to learn throughout life to do a better job. We continue to learn about God's word so that we can reflect Jesus more closely and be more closely transformed into his image. So we value not only the grace of God, but the word of God so that we don't lose sight of what's of first importance, what is written in God's word. So we value the gospel of grace. We value the word of God. Thirdly, we value people. Grace Bible Church. We are a church. Whenever you see the word church in the New Testament, this is the Greek word ekklesia. And the word essentially just means a gathering, an assembly of people, right? So a church is a group of people who get together to worship Jesus, to learn about the word of God. And then we go out into the world. And when we leave this room, actually, we're still the church. We don't stop. Stop being Grace Bible Church even when we go out into the community because we together are Grace Bible Church. Our new building is where Grace Bible Church Creekside will meet. We are the church, right? And so because of that, we say our goal is not simply to know information about God. Our goal is not simply to understand the gospel, but our goal is that we as a group of people, as a group of saints gathered together under Jesus Christ by the power of his spirit, we become people who reflect Jesus. So we value people. I don't know if you ever had a teacher or a professor who seemed to some degree to enjoy their subject matter, but to hate the students. Anybody ever have that kind of teacher or prof? I certainly did. I can remember one way back in college. He, he seemed to enjoy engineering, but he hated us. He told us that, right? I'm not guessing. He would tell us how terrible we were, how we were the worst group of students he had ever had in like his 40 years of teaching. Now, my belief is he probably told every group that because it was his belief that every successive group of students was worse than the last ones. He made it clear he didn't like us. And at some point in his life, he had forgotten that the purpose of his career as a teacher was not simply to know material or speak it out into the air, but to train students to be engineers. Right? There's no point in being a teacher. There's no point in being a teacher if you don't care about the students. There's no point in being a church if we don't take care of the people. Right? And so, uh, Dusty said it earlier, again, we help what? We help people find and follow Jesus. That's what we do. We help people find and follow Jesus in a couple of different ways. To find Jesus in in a deeper way day by day, we want all of us to be more like Jesus. Those of us who are on staff, we don't exist simply to do all the ministry. We're not here only to be the only ones that say, watch us live the Christian life, right? But instead, our goal is this. We want all of us to increasingly become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That is day after day after day. We grow to be more like him in the way we think, in the way we speak, in the things that we do. Romans chapter 12, Paul says it this way. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, Paul says, what I want you to do is not be conformed to the pattern of the world around you. 
the way that the world around us says we ought to think, whether that way comes through some media, whether TV or Facebook or the news or politics or whatever it is, or even through other people, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is, we want to be more like Jesus in the, in the fact that we study what the scripture says about who God is and who Jesus is, and we help one another come to a deeper understanding through the spirit of who Jesus is. Right? One of the questions sometimes people ask is, you know, in this day and age, when I can go onto a podcast, I can open up Apple Podcasts today, and I can find the best preachers in the world just by scrolling through and pressing a couple buttons. I could find the best worship music produced by the best bands in the world. Why do I come here? Right? Why still come here? Right? And here's why. Because we need each other to find and follow Jesus. We need one another. Right, I come into this room, and here's what happens. I know for me, as we sing quite often, I may come in in a place where I, I might be struggling with doubt, with unbelief, with fear, with trial in my life, or I'm just tired and I'm losing focus, and I walk in the room, and we begin to sing. And we sing about the death and the resurrection of Jesus and the love of God and the grace of God. And you know what happens? I look around and I see you guys singing too. I see kids who are four, five, six years old singing with me, and I see men and women who are in their 80s and 90s singing with me. And you know what happens is I go, there are others in this journey with me, and I need you to help me walk with Jesus. Those of us who are weak need the strong. Those of us who are strong need the weak. Those of us who are old need the young, and those of us who are young need the old. And so we come in this room not simply to hear a sermon or to hear some songs, but because we walk together to help one another to know Jesus better, to be transformed in his image. I learn about how to walk with Jesus by interacting with the body of Christ. And then we go out from here equipped for ministry to help others follow Jesus, to proclaim Jesus Christ in this community. Ephesians chapter four, Paul wrote, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That is, we become more like Jesus as we equip one another for ministry. In other words, the, the staff and the elders and the deacons, they, they're not here to do all of the ministry, but instead we equip one another for service. We say every person in the body of Christ has a place to use your gifts, to be a person in your community. I'm not in your workplace. I'm not in your neighborhood and you're not in mine. And so we each have a spot in this community where we have an impact for Jesus Christ, right? And so what we do is we come in here or we go to a Bible study on Wednesday night or to a group on Monday or whatever it is and we equip each other to do that so that we grow together in unity and maturity so that the world around us and the world at large can hear about the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. So we value the grace of God, we value the word of God, and we value people. So what do we do in response? By way of application, if that's what we value, what do we do in response? Well, first of all, we worship. We do come together and we worship to set our minds and hearts at the beginning of each week on who God is and what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. We sing these songs, like Ross said earlier, we sing these songs not just to God, but we actually sing them also for one another so that we can remind each other of the truth and experience and encounter God through his spirit. We pray together that God would have an impact through our lives. We pray for one another. We pray for those who are hurting. We pray for those who are suffering. We pray for those who are struggling, which really includes all of us in this room. That God would provide us comfort, that God would provide strength, and that God would equip us to do his work. We pray for our community to come to know Jesus. We pray for our world to come to know Jesus because we believe in the power of, of prayer and a God who listens to prayer. Together we grow and we serve. That's, that's what these tables, by the way, are about this morning. 
is our heart is that everybody in this place finds a place of growth where you say, I'm meeting with a group of people who are helping me know Jesus better. And then I have a place of service where I can use whatever God has given me, whatever strengths or gifts God has given me for the body of Christ. And then we proclaim. We go out into the community and we proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ because we carry the message of eternal life. So whether that's just in your neighborhood, with your family, in your workplace, or whether God calls you to go overseas short term or long term or to another state or another city, we say, I am on a mission and I want to run the race well. I want to focus until that day that I cross the finish line, that my purpose in life is to know Jesus and to reflect Jesus and to proclaim Jesus. I don't want to slack off until I cross the finish line. That's what Grace Bible Church is about. You'll remember a little over a year ago, we launched the Every Knee Initiative, right? And the idea behind the Every Knee Initiative was this, that we want to be a church that continues to impact this community for the gospel, right? And we talked about how we want to uh, plant additional campuses in Bryan College Station, how we want to plant churches domestically and overseas, right? And you may remember our primary objective was that all of us learn together, the joy of giving all that we have and all that we are to Jesus Christ, that we say, I want to run with focus and endurance to be a part of what God is doing. One of the reasons that we decided to pursue every knee, honestly, is because our community is growing. And every day, people are moving into our community, many of whom do not know Jesus Christ. Let me show you something for just a minute. The population of College Station. If you drive into College Station... The number you'll see on the sign is from the 2010 census, right? So it's nine years old, 93,857 people. That number is woefully wrong now. Okay, the current estimate, I got this this week from the city of College Station, 122,368. That's just College Station. That doesn't include Brian. By 2030, It's estimated that just College Station will have 160,000 plus people, right? I can can feel you stressing about the traffic right now. (laughs) Okay, it's okay. I can't do anything about the traffic. But the reality is that every year, literally thousands of people every year are moving into our community, many of them into this part of town. Right When we decided to launch the Creekside campus in 2015, uh, the thing that I noticed was this. At the time, we were the only church I was aware of that was south of William D. Fitch in College Station. Right, The next closest churches were in Navasota, once you go south. Now I'm aware of one other church in this particular area of town with, with tens of thousands of people who live in this part of College Station. And so, so we pursued this Every Knee initiative, not because we need Grace Bible Church to be the biggest or best known church in the community or in the state, but instead because we want to continue pressing forward until the day Jesus returns. My prayer is that after I am dead and gone, Grace Bible Church, if Jesus has not come back before then, Grace Bible Church will still be running hard after this vision. We're about halfway through the Every Knee Initiative. You may remember we had $22 million uh, committed by the congregation. We're right at about half of that that has come in, 10.9 million, just under 11 million. So we've still got work to do. The Lord has done some great things. We've been able to begin our building process, right? You may remember uh, that this was kind of the architect's rendering of what the building uh, is supposed to look like. Uh, We have begun the construction process. Foundation is now complete. I went out and took a couple pictures this week. This is where we are right now. So you've got steel structure is mostly there. Uh, They're getting the exterior walls up. It's beginning to come together, right? Lord willing, and please don't pin me down to this. I don't know if Ken Walsh is in the room this morning or not, so please don't kill me, Ken. But uh, we're hoping to be in that building by late spring still, right? Maybe May, maybe June, but sometime late spring, early summer at the latest. That's our prayer, right? It's coming together, right? So we are praying that that will become a place from where the gospel will go out for generations to come. 
You also heard, and Dusty mentioned it earlier, that we are looking at an additional property uh, in Bryan, in the Bryan Midtown area. That whole area is about to be uh, redone. They're going to uh, totally change what, what the footprint of that area of town looks like. But we are looking at the purchase of a piece of property. Here's a couple of pictures of the outsides of some of the buildings, right in the middle of a very significant area of Bryan. Right? That's why we're having, one of the reasons we're having our Grace Family Gathering tonight, we're going to vote on the purchase of that property. I'd encourage you, uh, whether you're a member or not, you can come out. Members, uh, we'd love you to come out because we're going to vote on this. We're going to vote on a couple of elders. We're going to approve some missionaries because we continue not only to want to share the gospel here in College Station and Bryan, but also around the world, right? So every Grace Family Gathering, we approve new missionaries, and as we grow, again, our desire is we continue to run fast, as fast as we can, and as hard as we can, not losing focus, praying that we won't get fatigued so that until the day Jesus returns, as long as there are people that need to know Jesus, we will continue to proclaim him and continue to stretch ourselves to proclaim him farther and wider. I mentioned a few moments ago that our series this fall, it's called Kingdom of Priests. It's from the books of Exodus through Deuteronomy. And uh, the reason we're calling it Kingdom of Priests is because that's a phrase that was used to describe what the nation of Israel was supposed to be. What does a priest do? A priest is, is basically somebody who mediates between God and men, right? So a priest helps people worship God, helps people follow God. That's what the priests in the Old Testament did. The scripture said to the nation of Israel, you guys are all essentially supposed to be a kingdom of priests. Maybe not literally, but all of you as a nation are meant to help people know God and follow God with what you say, with what you do, with where you go, with how you act, all of that. Now, the challenge with the nation of Israel is they didn't ever really do it that well. They fell into sin. They pursued idols. They disobeyed God. They experienced God's discipline and judgment. And so as you read through the rest of the Old Testament, you see God begin to put a plan in place, not only to provide a, 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 provide a solution for sin, but also to expand the boundaries of this kingdom of priests, not only for Jews, but for Gentiles, for everybody who would trust in Jesus. Now the scripture says, you and I, get to be a part of this kingdom of priests. Look at what 1 Peter says. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. In other words, Peter says, if you know Jesus, you're a part of that kingdom of priests to help people find and follow Jesus. You declare the praises of God. This is who we are. We are a people who have been called from darkness into light from death into life, from condemnation into forgiveness and hope. So Peter says, you're a part of that kingdom of priests, so until the day Jesus returns, you have the opportunity to declare far and wide the praises of him who called you. That's who we are as Grace Bible Church. That's who you are. That's who I am. We are a part of that kingdom of priests so that we pray until the day Jesus returns. We won't get tired we won't lose focus, but we'll run the race with endurance because God has called us to this task. That's why we do all that we do. And we pray that's how we will continue. I'm gonna pray and then in a moment we're gonna close in worship as we thank God for all he's given us in Jesus Christ and pray for the opportunity to represent him well. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for your word. We are grateful, though, above all, for the gift of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Father, we thank you that his death and his resurrection seals the reality that we have eternal life. We don't have to fear death because we know that we have eternal life with you through him. So, Father, I pray that we would know you better, that we would know Jesus better, that we'd become more like Jesus. And I also pray that we'd reflect Jesus. I pray that we would proclaim the praises of the one who called us out from darkness into your glorious light because we know we didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. In fact, all we earned was condemnation. All we earned was death. But in your grace, you gave us life and you offer it to everybody, everybody who believes in Jesus. Father, we pray that our mission would be that more would hear and more would believe 
and more would know how to find and follow Jesus Christ. Teach us to do that. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.